Very short overview of General Vesey's career. Enters the Minnesota National Guard as a private, adventurous, wants to ride a motorcycle, has no idea what he's got himself into. Depression era kid, is catapulted into World War II and walks out of that with a battlefield commission. Goes to 15 years of behind the scenes, very normal duty in the Army, and then takes off, seen for his talent and ability, and uh, selected for higher education, goes to Vietnam, he distinguishes himself on the battlefield with heroism that was almost unimaginable. Catches the eye of General Abrams, and from there he screams up through the general ranks. Has a confrontation with the President of the United States over our position in Korea. Assumes he's going to retire. Takes the second job in the Army instead of the chief, the vice chief. And out of nowhere, a new president comes on board and says, I want Jack Vesey to be my chairman. And Jack Vesey becomes the preeminent military man in the United States and leads us through the end of the Cold War and the defeat of the Soviet Union. Overall, he loved being a soldier, and uh, he surprised even his own wife when he made the decision to stay in the Army at the end of World War II. Millions of people left. Jack Vesey decided to stay, and he was questioned because he had other opportunities. But he loved the teamwork and the ability to work with people from all over our great nation and form a bond, do hard work, and accomplish great things. And that love of soldiering and being with soldiers stayed with him. Now, I will be honest that he would be frank in saying the Pentagon wore him down, but having muddy boots and being in the field with men and women in uniform, it refreshed him and invigorated him till the day he died. He would say that the work ethic that the men and women from the upper Midwest you know, had imbued into them from either agriculture or the Depression or both, brought a way of approaching problems. We're gonna work hard and we're gonna get this done. He was from a family uh, where his father was a railroad man and he had worked on the railroad. So he knew how to work with his hands. He knew how to be around uh, men doing tough work with machinery and that transferred very well for him into his military experience. He wasn't afraid of machinery, he wasn't afraid of hard work. He wasn't afraid to be out of doors. He loved scouting, and scouting was a big part of his Minnesota upbringing. And his Lutheran values, he imbibed those and brought those with him all the way into the Pentagon and to the 1983 prayer National Prayer Breakfast where he's the only general officer to have ever been the featured speaker. I'm gonna tell you some things that are seemingly minor, but they tell you about the major things. Number one, the man was given a battlefield commission on Anzio, the beach of Anzio, during World War II in Italy. They didn't hand those things out just to anybody. So if his life had ended there, he had accomplished an amazing leadership feat in the crucible of battle. From there, he goes on to do increasingly amazing accomplishments. He invents a firing ring for use by artillery at Fort Sill. I'm talking about inventing something that never was had before. Because he looks at these firing rings used to direct artillery. This is old school before computers. And he realizes the firing rings being used by the Army had been invented by somebody who was left-handed. Don't ask me how he figured that out, but he literally invented a right-handed firing ring, tested it, and realized he could bring guns online and rounds down range 15 seconds faster on average than the original ring designed for left-handed people. 15 seconds in a battle can be an eternity. He invented that. Pretty amazing. When he was in Vietnam, he brought the same inventive skills to the battlefield. And I say this to you because Vesey's major accomplishment was improving everything he put his hands on. His favorite phrase was, never be inhibited by the inability to improve things. Everything can be made better. 
the uh, base that he was uh, on in Vietnam was being mortared and men were being killed on a routine basis. The Viet Cong would pull up, lob some rounds in and take off into the jungle and it, the Americans were vulnerable. Vesey created a very simple device that proved to be in incredibly effective. He created a board, he called it an idiot board, and when pe people in observation towers would hear a round, because you could hear when it left the tube, they were to mark on the board the direction they heard. All of that was fed back to a central fire correction center, and using trigonometry, everybody's hearing, points of hearing, they could figure out where it had been fired from, fire on it. Casualties went down dramatically, and it caught the eye of General Wyan, the uh, division commander, and it was the beginning of General Vesey's being noted by senior officers as an up-and-comer. So he's always making things better for the Army, for the soldiers, and he does that everywhere he goes. He pioneers a way to take nuclear weapons out into the field in Germany. Not done, not supposed to be done. He showed it could be done, done safely and securely, and more realistic training for his soldiers. Get to the, get to the weapons faster if they were attacked. He set a pattern, and he kept being noted as a man who made things, turned things around, made things better. Took organizations that nobody else wanted and made them into champion organizations. By the time he gets to be Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, he has managed to, as part of a team effort, not remove American soldiers from the peninsula of Korea and probably save South Korea from being invaded by North Korea in the late 1970s. That was a Vesey accomplishment, recognized throughout the Army, that his persistent ability to stand before the President and say, sir, what you want to do is not the thing to do. Here's why. And then go before Congress and make that same case. It turned a president's directive on its head, and we're still there today. That's Jack Vesey. The South Koreans recognize that to this day, and if you go to the headquarters there, it's named after General Vesey. Our headquarters in South Korea. That tells you something that the man accomplished. If he'd retired at that point, he'd done pretty amazing things in the Army, but he didn't retire. He's Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. His fingerprints are on all of Army Special Operations today. He comes to the Vice Chief's office after Operation Eagle Claw fails in Iran. And um, his boss, General Meyer, puts him in charge of, we gotta do something on the Army side to have quick reaction forces, highly trained special forces, so this never happens again. So what you saw happen in 2001 in Afghanistan, Jack Bessie's got his fingerprints on that. Did he ever tell anybody? You'd have to dig into the archives, because he wasn't about bragging. The modern major weapon systems that were fielded during the Reagan administration, Vesey was involved in when he was the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army when President Carter was President. And Harold Brown, who was the Secretary of Defense, Vesey, and the teams under Vesey were responsible for the development of the M1 Abrams tank. And it was Vesey's testimony in Congress that got that finally pass all the hurdles and into production. Apache helicopter, the Black Hawk helicopter, the Patriot missile system that gained fame in Desert Storm, still being used today. Shoulder launched uh, Stinger missile, which the Mujahideen used to drive the Russians out. All of these things were being developed while Vesey was Vice Chief of Staff of the Army overseeing all these programs and making sure they got shepherded through Congress and into production. When he becomes the chief, which he never expected to be, he's the guy that fields them and gets them into the force. And oh, by the way, ships, submarines, fighter planes, all that stuff gets fielded by the team that he led. He doesn't get the exclusive credit and wouldn't want it, but he's the guy that got that out to the field to uh, stare down the Soviets and to not only match, but exceed their capabilities. And that leads to the end of the Cold War. So in my mind, when we, since we never had a Cold War celebration parade, we never got a chance to see Jack Vesey at the head of the parade because he was the general officer at the height of the last hot, hot, hot phase of the Cold War that looked across at his Soviet counterpart and said, you don't want to fight us because we have all of this.
The Cold War was extremely dangerous and very deadly. At times it became a hot war, but it was always tense, always deadly, and at times it came close to annihilating the human race on the planet. We know about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but most of us don't know that in 1983 we had an exercise held by the Allies in Western Europe that was misinterpreted by the Soviets and led them to begin to take all the steps to do a preemptive strike on us because they thought we were going to do one on them. Very shortly thereafter, we have the shoot down of, uh, of a civilian airline off the uh, coast of the Soviet Union that again almost led us to a kinetic confrontation with the Soviet Union. We had many, many, many times where we came very close to exchanging nuclear missiles. But calm men like Vesey, who got facts and made decisions with reason, not passion, kept us from escalating and yet kept the pressure on the Soviet Union until it collapsed. To understand the Reagan administration's approach to dealing with the Cold War, it's important to know a little bit about what went before. So by this point, we have faced the Soviets 45 up to 1945 to 1980. We've tried a variety of approaches. We fought a war with the, with the North Koreans, armed by the Soviets, supported by the Soviets and the Chinese. We've seen this communist ideology blossom all around the world. We've seen proxy wars by 1980 in hosts of places. And we've backed one side and the Soviets have backed another side, most notably Vietnam. And that hasn't gone well for us. The politicians could go home and forget about Vietnam. Vesey couldn't, and neither could the men of his era, because they saw and lost great American lives, great South Vietnamese lives. Men like Jack Vesey, they knew what the Soviet was about, the Soviet Union was about. The fight hadn't ended. It was just going to move to someplace else. And they knew they needed to be prepared. But we had adopted under Richard Nixon and that further through the presidents after a, 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 an approach to the Soviets of detente. Hey, we gotta live with you. We have to live with the Soviet Union. They're a world superpower. We've gotta make some accommodations. They're gonna be here, we're gonna be here. We have to resist them, but at the same time, we've got to deal with them. Reagan turns that on its ear, and he's, he's convinced, hey, we don't have to accept the Soviet Union and its ideology as a fact forever. The ideology is flawed, and its practice is corrupt, and we need to not only resist it, we need to defeat it. And so Reagan sets about to use every tool in the American arsenal, diplomacy, information, the military, and economic means to constrain, constrict, and defeat the Soviets. And Vesey is the iron fist in a velvet glove. Secretary Schultz is the diplomatic initiative. There's an information initiative. There's an economic initiative, and, and then uh, Bill Casey is the uh, CIA director, and he's the in the shadows taking the fight to the Soviets. And these men are on the same page. They're all World War II veterans, and they support the president and the desire to defeat the Soviets. But the man who feels it viscerally is Vesey, who has seen the Soviets shed blood around the world, and who knows that we can defeat them if we have the equipment and the training. They're, they're, they're not 10 feet tall. They've got weaknesses, and those weaknesses can be exploited, and they can be beaten. This is not common thinking of the day, but Vesey takes the tools that the Reagan administration is able to um, develop and field with the economic policies that they have and with the uh, military budget that they give to the Department of Defense. And Vesey's able to take an army that was on its back and hollow, and that's a term that uh, was used by General Meyer when Vesey was his number two, the vice chief, the army is hollow. He's able to take a military that's struggling to recruit, that's antiquated, that can't keep its ships out at sea, and in his tenure, field new equipment, modernize, maintain, improve the quality of life 
recruit like we've never recruited before and put that army on the front line and choke the Soviet Union everywhere they fielded forces. Vesey, of his many notable things, he's the last World War II soldier in the army of his day. And he's wearing the Minnesota Red Bull patch on his uniform all the years he was in the army. And when he retires, he's the man that presidents go to when there are anniversaries of World War II and they want somebody that fought in the war to represent the United States. So when the 50th anniversary of the end of World VE Day takes place, there are so many celebrations around Europe, there are not enough World War II veterans to go to all these. And Vesey's selected to represent the United States military and the United States of America in Red Square because the Soviets, or the Russians at that time, were our allies. And it's one of his signature events. But he also represented us in Italy. He represented us in Normandy when President Reagan gave his famous speech about the boys of Point de Hoc. Vesey willingly kept the flame of the memory of the sacrifice of those who served in World War II alive, all the way up to the dedication of the World War II monument in Washington, D.C., and he was on the board of directors that developed that, along with uh, Senator Dole and uh, Senator Inouye. So these are great men who shed blood in World War II, who worked together for a common cause to remember the sacrifice of their brothers and sisters who had died. Pretty amazing. Uh, again, a role that he never talked about, he just did it. When the president would ask, a president would ask, he would go. General Vesey has a stellar reputation in the Hmong community, in the Laotian community, and Cambodian and Thai community in the United States. General Vesey was a key player in 1972 and three in the war in Laos. A very unique war run by the State Department, funded by the Department of Defense, with an army fielded of Laotians, Hmong, other uh, ethnic minorities in Laos and in Cambodia fighting a very effective guerrilla war against the North Vietnamese. Almost the flip of what was happening in South Vietnam where the Viet Cong were fighting us, we were the conventional forces. Well, in Laos and Cambodia, the North Vietnamese are the conventional forces and we're using, in a sense, their tactics against them. Well, Vesey's watch turns out to be two of the most effective years in repelling the North Vietnamese. And the Hmong revere him for the training and support and his personal courage. General Vesey went into Laos on a regular basis and went to where the fighting was. He didn't stay back uh, in the capital where he could be relatively safe. He flew his own helicopter at times and put himself where artillery was needed or being exchanged as an artilleryman and as an army soldier, he wanted to make sure the, that the Hmong had what they needed and all the, all the other groups in uh, Laos. So he had fame in those populations that I wasn't aware of and most people aren't. Well, as we fast forward through the Reagan years, Vesey leaves early, it's noteworthy, comes back to Minnesota, is living in Garrison and gets a call from the president in 1986 president wants to address the POW MIA issue that still lingers over the Vietnam generation. What happened to the men that never returned? And to tell you that this is a hot button issue is an understatement. And I don't know if today we could ever understand how contentious that issue was. But I will tell it to you this way. General Vesey would say, when you drive by a a post office, look up and tell me if you see an MIA POW flag. If you do, ask yourself why it's there. Well, of course I saw the flags all the time, but I never thought, why is it there? How did this come to be and why is it still flying? But the more I dug into this, the more I realized this button, this issue became the hot, hot issue post-Vietnam. And it wrapped up everything that was terrible and contentious about that war. Can we trust our government? Were men betrayed? Were men left behind intentionally? Do the Soviets have these men? What's been done to them? 
and misinformation, disinformation, it was rampant and it divided the country and it divided the Vietnam generation. And General Vesey accepted the assignment to walk into the middle of that and bring together the fullest accounting of what happened. Well, he expended all the moral capital he had to accomplish that mission because he was criticized from every side. And when I began to peel those layers back in Washington, D.C., all of his critics came forward to this day to say, hey, he was part of a conspiracy, there's still people there, etc." This issue hasn't died. The man had the fortitude, courage, and passion to go to North Vietnam repeatedly over a six-year period, stare down some of the hardest leaders in the world of the day, and bring them to a negotiated agreement to work with us to find and repatriate the remains of everybody and account for everybody. If you think about that, that's never been done before. That's never been the American way. We still can't find people from World War I and II, Korea. But this war, in a jungle, in a mountain environment, over a sea, we're committed to finding everybody. And Vesey set in motion a system, a process, and a means to do that. And then it's expanded around the world to include all the missing from all our wars. And it works. And the number of people that we can't find in Vietnam decreases on a regular basis. And people have given their lives to do this, but Vesey gave his retirement years. Didn't have to do it. Most people would say, I don't need that headache that trauma, I don't want to revisit that war, he went right back into it and did it in a remarkable way. It's a feat of diplomacy, it's a feat of courage, it's a feat of um, patriotism. He, he uh, was quiet and humble about, but it was known in the Hmong community, it was known in the Laotian community, the Thai community, and in the healthiest of the veteran community. So when you see that flag, remember General Vesey. So General Vesey is buried at the uh, cemetery outside of Camp Ripley, State of Minnesota's Veterans Cemetery, with his wonderful wife, uh, Avis, in a beautiful spot right in the center of the cemetery. And that's by his choice. Avis died first, he had her buried there, and arranged to be buried beside her. It's where he first served in the military at Camp Ripley, and it's near where they had their home all the years that uh, after their retirement. It's in the part of the country that he loved the best and it's surrounded, it's fitting. He's surrounded by humble members of the state militia who didn't seek fame or fortune. They did their duty, came back to Minnesota and uh, had productive lives. And I think that's the, ve the way General Vesey wanted to be remembered. Not as some famous general, but as a Minnesotan who did his duty to the best of his ability and came home to be with the people that he grew up with and serve a quiet, humble life. How do I take on the responsibility of giving voice to one of the most remarkable Americans of our time? It is a very humbling task and I'm not up to the challenge. So I'm hoping that others will come after me and burnish the image of this man by doing deeper research. I feel, after having served in the Pentagon during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, I feel that his legacy is important to inform future leaders that there is a way to lead at the highest levels of our country with integrity, to give accurate advice to our president and to those who make the terrible decision of going to war whether they're ready to hear it or not, to give them accurate, honest advice, regardless of whether that advances your career or not. Vesey was a man who gave unvarnished, good, solid, fact-based advice and stayed out of the politics. We need men and women like that. We're a powerful country with means to wage war 
To do that and wage war is a somber, sober decision that needs great military leaders advising who are willing to tell the truth, whatever that costs them. And Bessie, I believe, was a one of a kind. And we've suffered in this country, I think, because we didn't have more Bessies.